15 minutes, and then, then uh, one of my students will be coming up, somebody you've been hearing all, seeing all this time, uh, Yu Ming, will be here. She thinks her name's Lucy uh, sometimes. She, that's what she communicates to others. I, I refuse to call her Lucy. I'd rather call her Yu Ming. Um, but she, she'll be talking, talking uh, briefly to us, and then we'll go to questions and, questions and answers. Uh, I walked in, and, and Sally said, uh, why are you dressed the way you are, Jim? And I said it was to show the great respect I have for the other speakers and, and, and the people in the audience. And he said, no, tell me the truth. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is one of what I like to call a basic Stanford day. I, st I started in the morning with, with a meeting that in, uh, with the uh, Canadian Minister for Natural Resources and the Council General for, for Canada here. I went after that with a meeting for the head of uh, uh, a Clean Energy Council in Chile. And tonight, I'm going to go to a reception with Hillary Clinton. So it's, you know, your basic Stanford day of what goes on here. Uh, so that's why I'm really dressed up the way I do. Normally, those who see me will, will have me dress. You mean stand up on the jeans, that sort of level <laughs> uh, would, would be more normal. So what I'd like to do is uh, not talk at all about technology. Just talk about, and not talk about the supply of energy. And you've heard a lot about the supply of energy and technology. I want to talk about the use of energy. And I want to talk about some behavioral issues that are associated with it. So first, I want to remind you what the mixes of energy that uses, we use in the United States. Um, there's lots of discussion about some very exciting technologies on the supply side. Wind and solar and geothermal, really very important and very much growing. Um, solar has grown from that to that. And uh, it'll grow bigger, but it's grown from that to that. Wind has actually grown from that to that. Um, geothermal is a little smaller. Uh, our energy system is dominated by the fossil fuels, petroleum, natural gas, and coal. And those are the ones that release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And those are carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. As you all know, global climate change, you've heard about half a dozen people tell you the same fact. So you may think about, in the short term, in the next 10, 20 years, if you want to deal with the energy problem, do you think about how you quadruple this? Oh, what if you took 10 or 20% off of those? Where's the action? And I think where we're, I'm coming from is not that you ignore this new energy supplies, but the point is if you're thinking about energy policy, you want to think about both the supply and the demand, how we use energy and how we supply it. Because how we manage this in the next 20 years is absolutely fundamental to whether we can start getting a handle on the issues of global climate change. Well, as we start doing that, we can say we, we might want to reduce the use of energy. And we say, well, maybe it's really costly. But we, we've got work from, this is a curve from McKinsey. Um, that in fall has done the same sort of thing. And I disagree with some of the numbers, but the basic concept I agree with. It says if you want to reduce carbon dioxide, you can look at the horizontal axis as gigatons of carbon dioxide reductions. And it says, how can you do it? Well, you can do it by distributed photovoltaics or residential buildings, lighting. But the vertical axis is McKinsey's estimate of the cost per ton of carbon dioxide reduction. And so those that go up that way are it's going to cost you money. It's a positive cost. Those that go down this way, it saves you money. So by McKinsey estimates, let's look at some of the names that save you money by reducing carbon dioxide. 
residential electronics, residential buildings and lighting, commercial electronics, fuel economy uh, packages, cars, uh, industrial process improvements, new shell improvements on commercial buildings. What they have in common is how we use energy. It's not how we supply energy. And the positive costs are distributed photovoltaic, uh, active forest management. This is, a, this is a, how we use it, um, commercial buildings. So some of the ways we use it are costly. So point one, it looks like there's a lot of negative cost ways of reducing the use of energy. I have my own graph that uh, I developed and said, what are some of the physical things we can do? The, going up in this axis is decreasing energy use. This direction is reducing cost. Um, the distance out doesn't matter. I just have boxes that are, I ran out of, I, I didn't want to put so many boxes that people couldn't read it. So I hope that you can read these things. LED is light emitting diodes. That's going to be the absolute new uh, je, uh, revolution in lighting. It's, it, it's going to, we're, before too long, 10, 20 years, we're not going to want compact fluorescent bulbs or fluorescent or incandescent because LED is just going to be dominating over, over all of those. Uh, Plug-in hybrids, um, all those others, but I've color-coded them. The yellow are things that still need new technology. So if we're going to reduce energy use and reduce costs, there's really research opportunities, technological developments. And I think in plug-in hybrids, plug-in hybrids are not economical right now by any, any normal calculation. But they are going to be. And these are sort of a new technology that's being developed. Optimized building construction. The reason we can't optimize building construction is the software is pathetic for doing that. Uh, take, for example, in the Y2E2 building, use the conventional software that talks about the speed at which you can cool off the building by night flush. What we do is op open the vents and cold air comes in at night and cools off the building. The conventional models that are used to look at that say something like, that should happen in 20 minutes. It's pretty good. Um, when we do it, in, do it in the actual building, it takes six hours. So there's a mismatch between what the current models are and what actually happens. Well, that's a fundamental research. Most of the models don't have the thermodynamics in it. So that's a, that's a research opportunity. So the yellow says you can develop uh, R&D needed for those in technology areas, wonderful opportunities. Smart building controls with, with intelligence and learning machines and so forth, opportunities. Okay, then there's the green. Those tend to be regulatory issues. Um, fuel efficiency standards, appliance labeling, regional land development. It's all those things that governments might want to do. But what's the white? That doesn't need either. Those are, those doesn't need new technology, no regulations. It's just what people do or companies do. Replace old appliances. If you have a refrigerator that's 20 years old, you'll save money by throwing the thing away and just buying a brand new one because it's so much more efficient. Um, AC-DC converters are converting the AC from the wall into the DC your, your computer uses. Vast differences, an order of magnitude difference in the efficiency of that conversion. Enterprise management software, companies having the information base that can take control of their energy use. Mostly, energy use is, an over, is treated as an overhead item in most companies. And therefore, most managers don't manage what's an overhead item. They manage what's, what they're evaluated for. And it's been too hard to gather that information. Now, the financial, financial corporation, we have financial management software that allows the CFO to gather information throughout and evaluate what the different divisions and parts are doing. We don't do that very well in energy. But there's a whole new generation, a few different companies that are out there that now have enterprise management software that allow companies to find the, those low-hanging fruit. So 
both take the McKinsey estimate in mind, the um, five minutes left all. Wow. OK. Uh, <laughs> so I lied about how long I'll take. Um, it says that the, a lot of things we could save money and reduce energy use, but it's not, hap it's not, a, not all of them are happening. If you go back to the McKinsey curve here, and you were to draw that 20 years ago, it would have looked about the same. So if you have a lot of low-hanging fruit, and it's not getting picked, maybe there's an electric fence between you and the fruit. Something is causing that to happen. So the question is what? And we have a, uh, some of the things that we've been looking at. Some of the barriers to optimality. Some are institutional, having to do things like the structure of crafts and the building uh, construction how corporations are organized now. Um, some of the regulatory policies get in the way. Others are traditional market failures that economists tend to study. Externalities, principal agent problems. I'll go back to an example of principal agent problems. But it's one person uh, is the agent supposedly acting for somebody else. But that person acting has their own motives. And so they may not optimize for the person that they're acting for. And I'll give you an example for, for rental housing. Some of you may have faced rental housing in your life. Uh, poor information, incomplete markets. Then a set of behavioral issues that I'll call low salience of energy issues. Uh, and let me give you an example of what I mean by low salience. Um, how many of you have ever gone grocery shopping? OK. Now, I want to postulate a store a little bit different than the ones that you went shopping in. You went to this store, and you, you, you decided you want some meat. And there was filet mignon, and flank steak, and chuck steak. There was hamburgers. There just wasn't any price tags on it. And in fact, you've never seen a price tag in a supermarket your whole life. So you buy a lot of filet mignon, and you'll fill up the cart. And you go out, they check it out. They, there were prices, apparently, because they do some checking out. And they thank you and say goodbye. You still don't know anything. But at the end of the month, you get a bill that says groceries, $400. Now, you probably wouldn't be a good shopper, but how is that different from how anybody buys electricity? Except if you come from Australia, it's at the end of the quarter, not at the end of the month, that you get that bill. So you. You have very poor information about the mapping between what you do and what the consequences are. So you don't expect Adam Smith's invisible hand to work. Second is, is the cost consequences. If you look at, um, now let me just, no, let's, let's do this. Um, uh, the total expenditures in the residential area, this is through retail electricity. Natural, ga uh, natural gas and petroleum, is about 2.3% of people's disposable income. It's not a lot of their income. 2.3% of the disposable personal income on average means you have very poor information, and it doesn't seem like it has a large consequence to you. So while you could, in principle, gather lots of information, you don't. It's just not worthwhile. So that's the sort of low salience, the sort of behavioral issue. Uh, let's talk about principal agent problems. If you look at the um, um, landlord who may pay the cost of making the house more fuel efficient, and the renter that pays the cost of the utility bills, that's a mismatch. Now, you can, in principle, the renter goes and says, well, I want to rent the house, but show me the utility bills over the last six months. I want to evaluate it, and I want to um, look at uh, how well your attic is insulated, and what do you think the response would be? Say, so, good, Why, while you're doing it, I'm signing a rental contract with somebody else. And so it's a mismatch. Well, empirically, this is California data. You look at the market penetration of things like insulated walls, energy efficient technologies. 60% if it's owner occupied, 38% if it's rented. Insulated attic, 80%, 40%. So this principal agent problem is out there. So again, this is an economic issue. So how do you start dealing with it? Well, there's many ways of dealing with it. You might want to go through economics. <laughs> uh, 
You know, you, you can, uh, for people who can't read this, it says it runs on this conventional gasoline-powered engine until it senses guilt, at which point it switches over to battery power. Well, meant to be funny from a New Yorker, in fact, people respond to not just economic issues, but social incentives, comparisons to their neighbors, what they do. So you give people a, a utility bill and tell them not just what their bill is, but how much their neighbors spent, not by name, just by aggregate. And they reduce their use of energy, uh, maybe in the order of 10%. So that there's a lot of behavioral responses. I've got a whole list, which I'm not going to go through it. That is getting the prices right, um, uh, getting feedback and, and uh, meters and giving feedback. So, so you turn this grocery store into one where you can actually see the prices when you make the decisions, uh, stochastic motivations, uh, embarrassing people by having a long, loud gong that makes them sit down. There's a lot of other motivations and things that actually cause behavioral changes which you're going to see this moment, a behavioral change. So thank you. That's it. <laughs>